So thank you so much for being here today. Um, it's, it's a relatively new um, way that we wanted to present this information because in the end, it's very easy to talk about uh, implementation itself. We have implemented this toolkit, we have like uh, these many indicators and uh, the, we have these many dashboards. But what kind of impact and how we can evaluate that impact is a completely different story. And it's just as necessary to advocate for more resources, to advocate for for um, more information, to advocate for more uh, for more trainings and for more investment in these type of activities is necessary to also prove the impact that these that these monitoring and and the actual operation themselves are having on people. Um, ah, okay, sorry. So. That is a very general uh, way of defining as well what we want to achieve with like evaluating and monitoring and assessing the impact of the of the of the implementations that we do. We want to check whether we have achieved these goals, what type of factors played a role in the achievement of these goals, and um, and uh, what type of interventions we had, and uh, and how we also achieved those goals. There are different ways that. Um, we can use in order to um, monitor the impact and evaluation activities. Of course, one of them that a lot of people know are the theory of change. And um, and there are different steps and different degrees to which like, you can start addressing the, the role of DHIS towards the achievement of these goals. Of course, impact, for example, the impact alone, which are like the long-term sustainable uh, goals that you are getting, Attributing it directly to DHS, it might be a little bit more difficult because there are a lot of like key factors that are playing all together. But for example, the right outputs, the immediate results that you are given out of your activities, out of your implementations, these are like pretty much like our golden standard of where we can actually start seeing the impact of implementing DHIS for your programs. So um, there are different ways of monitoring it. Or for example, like uh, there is also the the health information impact framework, which is something that I always refer to, there are different aspects that can be that can be monitored in order to understand better the impact of the type of implementations that you have. Of course, everyone has different uh, has different ways of of doing it. There is no one golden standard of how to approach this, but um, nonetheless, understanding how things worked out and why things worked out that way. It's fundamental to start advocating for for more resources and uh, and also just showing that things are working well with the resources that we had. It's not that we always need to advocate for more. It can also be that we're doing great and let's do it. And uh, so there are different frameworks that you can use. Of course, the theory of change is like probably the most known, and it's also what like for example organizations like Gavi is using the most. But this is also a really good paper that I put also the the um, the reference down there and you can also download the, the the slides so you can also have access but i think it's a it's a very useful way of of seeing the different aspects that um an impact can uh, can be framed for and of course i don't think i have to explain it to you but there are there it's it's fundamental to start um assessing the impact of uh, of interventions as well uh we need to start assessing the effectiveness we need to start um uh, assessing the how much these uh, these implementation are actually supporting these interventions and how much the the how the platform itself is supporting the decision making towards the achievement of these goals. And we also need to start understanding what are the strengths and the weaknesses of these implementations, because we can see very well, for example, that, ah, yes, we have produced X dashboards, but we might not understand why some dashboards are used more than others and why some visualizations are used more than others, or how uh, are our end users really perceiving this uh, this type of uh, this type of platform? It could be that overall at national level it's working fantastic, but then you go down at the facility level and they hate it. So you need to also start assessing the different levels of use of the platform itself in order to really start understanding where the problems are and what type of achievements you want to concretize. So I'm putting it in all the information, but still, you might have seen it this morning again. For those who have not seen it in the auditorium, I'm sorry, one, I have not changed it. Um, there is also more information about toolkits and the type of, of, uh, of um, um, metadata packages and toolkits in general, global toolkits we put out in order to support 
countries in order to make sure that countries might start if they want from a, a, a standard uh, a standard uh, way of collecting data and among those we also have like some uh, some work on triangulation and and uh, and uh, impact evaluation and uh, and yeah so in case you are more interested and you have more questions it's a very open session so today um we have uh, we have three presenters although i only see two unfortunately hopefully the third comes up um we have uh, ah because this is an older version that's it um we have uh, patrick today um who works uh, at the at uh, hisp uh, uganda unfortunately olivia forget that you see olivia this is an older version but uh, patrick is going to talk uh, about the evaluation this is a second round of evaluation that they've done about uh, the implementation of some uh, immunization dashboards so he will let us know more about how the implementation is going, but also how they are evaluating the impact of that implementation. Then we also have Brandeep, um, who works at FHI 360. And of course, they also started doing quite a lot of work of evaluation on their HIV um, implementations. And uh, unfortunately, Blaise did not make it. Uh, it's very sad, but we hopefully have uh, Adolf, who is going to present on his behalf. Um, they are from his Rwanda, and they started working on a, on a bunch of triangulation dashboards in collaboration with the CDC. And uh, we wanted to start monitoring what were the impacts of the implementation of these triangulation dashboards. They were triangulation dashboards between immunization and surveillance. So we wanted to start to understand maybe this time more from a technical point of view rather than just purely on, uh, on an analysis point of view, because in the end, implementations and, and, and evaluations can be at different levels, of course. But we wanted to understand better um, how things were implemented and what uh, were a bit the the downfalls and the added values of that implementation since we know the triangulations from the previous session is super important. So without further ado, if Prandip wants to start, I have no, I have no comment or desire whatsoever, but you choose. Okay, perfect. Um, how do I, do I, I'm, I'm sorry. You, you know how to do it? Okay, fantastic, sorry. This is the screen that is done. So I drag it exactly. Okay, no need to drag. I think I need I need a view, this view. Yes. Yes. It's okay. Voila. Yeah. Yes, yeah. 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 Sure. Thank you. Yeah. Is good. Okay. Hi everyone. Good afternoon. I am Anu Kumar Haku, uh, working as a senior technical advisor for strategic information. In uh, a USAID funded project, uh, I'm here to share our uh, learnings, uh, which we did in Liberia on the EPIC. So, this was uh, actually uh, the abstract was submitted by our colleague who is from Liberia, Rachel Limo, but uh, due to some reasons, he don't come here so i am presenting this uh, our good practices on the use of line listing uh, which we used in liberia so here before we go to the uh, how is this is done yeah so before we go to the the main sessions uh, i will i would like to say about our uh, project so epic is a five year uh, five year USAID PFA funded project, which is uh, for the achieving and maintaining HIV control. And then uh, the EPIC is programmed by EPIC 360 with sub partners uh, PSI, Palladium Group, and Right to Care. So, Liberia become a PFA funded country effective from October 2019. To complement the efforts of government to end HIV epidemic under the leadership of uh, Ministry of uh, Health of Liberia. So here in EPIC, we are in the 45 countries now, uh, 41 countries. So these all countries are using uh, DHIS2 as an aggregate level aggregate level, but uh, the seven countries are using the DHS to 
Tiago since the last five years. So now uh, currently we are going to share the success of line listing uh, app uh, where we use this app to ensure the treatment of the PLHIV on the HIV program. So uh, it's about the Liberia now. So here, um, Liberia, we are implementing program in 26 PFR supported health facilities through the 10 community civil society organizations. So we call them as a CSO. So here, uh, the main aim of the program is to uh, linking the heart to this uh, community people with the health facility. So for that, uh, we have the, the 10 CSO partners. They have been supporting to link the community with the health uh, facilities. So when we start the program in 1990s, uh, Liberia has a program from the 1990s, and there they used to rely on the the paper base. As we all know, in the uh, starting days, every country has the same problem, but they were using the the paper based system. And then the paper based system has lots of challenges, like the poor documentation, filing and storage of the files, which led to the the, the poor quality of HIV data. So before I go to the uh, the main um, activity that we did, uh, uh, as you can see here, uh, how the paper we are managed in, in the health facility, and then we introduced the DTHIS2 there. But here, we are not going to share how we uh, customize this and implement this. This is uh, another part of the story. But here, uh, after we implemented DDHS2, how we use this system to to track each individuals in the community to bring them back on the, the treatment. So here, before I say about the land listing uh, strategy, as we all know, HIV program, in a HIV program, once a person is diagnosed as uh, a, a HIV positive, that person has to come on the treatment uh, according to the doctor's prescription and the medication. If the person or the PLHIV miss any doses, then there's an issue of adherence. It means the person, the PLHIV has to be followed up in the community regularly so that the person does not miss the pills and then they have the uh, highly suppressed status, right? So for that, to help that uh, process, we uh, applied the two methods. The first one is we, we trained all the healthcare providers who are working in the health facility on the DHIS2 is using the, the land listing system. So the healthcare providers were trained on how to develop the land listing uh, from the DHIS2 and how to download this in an Excel file and then also share those files or, or the, the printed copy to the outreach, outreach workers. We call it uh, community managers or the case managers. And then the case manager uses that, uh, the land list for the follow up in the community. They, they went to the community uh, according to the land list and then they provide uh, education on the importance of medication, adherence, support back to treatment, and what is the importance of having suppressed by a load. So with the help of that land list uh, approach, our case managers were su succeeded to bring the people back on the treatment. And then, uh, to analyze that method, as he was sharing, to measure the output impact in the evaluation, we applied the two methods. The first one was descriptive analysis. There we summarize and describe the characteristics of the, the data collected, such as the client 
detention rates, loss to follow up rates, viral load coverage, and then suppression rates. After that, we also did a comparison, the pre and post comparison, and there we see uh, how the the land list was utilized by the by the the case managers. So with implementing this uh the land list tool what we found is we compare the the data from the a, a, a starting phase this is uh, in the usid program we call it the quarter one is october november december uh, of this year so we started that you know, program in the land listing app using to of the individuals, so, so we see over the time of period from 2020 December up to the uh, 24 this, uh, January, those people who are on the treatment for less than three months, they were not coming on the treatment about 1620, but now everyone is coming on treatment. There is no loss to follow up on the treatment. Everyone is on the treatment. Though here we have some uh, areas to work, but, but, but due to some limitations, the limitations are the informations which was given in the system are not correct. The persons are not actual in the community. The phone number are, are not the same. That's why the team is, is struggling to uh, the close this gap. Otherwise, these persons has come to the zero. It means there is a zero loss to follow up of those persons who started the treatment in the last three months. And then the other, another success was about the viral load uh, coverage and suppression rates. So the viral load coverage was around 66% when we start this the land listing app using, but now it goes up to the 92% coverage, and then the suppression work rate also <laughs> went from 82% up to the 97%. Not only this, with the success of this, our land listing in DHIS2, government of Liberia, Ministry of Health, we are very happy with this, and they are approached with the uh, EPIC and the USID, and then uh, we had started discussions on how to scale up this DHIS2 at the country level in the all their health facilities. So now, um, next month, we are going to uh, finishing the handover process of the metadata and the program data to the uh, Ministry of Health. After that, we have a series of activities the training of the new individuals, the follow-up, and, and so many support services. So this is w w one of the best examples which we have seen in Liberia, how DHIS2 app has supported to be a, a scale up at the national level after a, a, a starting the system just from a 26 sites. So uh, uh, as I said earlier, uh, we did have a challenge to uh, I I improve our impact in the output. So uh, as I said earlier, there were uh, inconsistent documentation in the, the notebook and the counter books. So we see here, I think this is uh, the familiar uh, picture where the medications, the uh, ART fill up details are on the sheet books. So from the sheet books, we transfer these all into the DHIS2. That was the major challenge. And from there, we have to follow up the every person for the treatment. And then otherwise, the, the missing information, there was no age, uh, sex, and the, the population type. Because we all know uh, HIV is concentrated on a certain population, right? So there should be a clear population type so that we can follow up them in the community uh, and then we can provide the uh, the services according to the their uh, requirement and then um, the big the big challenge was the population uh, who was listed in the files listed in the DHIS2 for the follow up 
was not actually in the community. So uh, the conclusion uh, that we uh, learned from this, uh, the best practices of using the land list is the case managers are helpful if we provide them the, uh, uh, the, the list of individuals with the help of the uh, accurate system, that is the DHIS2 land list, which ultimately can uh, improve the coverage of HIV treatment, the coverage of uh, the, the, the viral load, and uh, suppress the, uh, the viral load. And then these findings are very utilizing to for the data-driven uh, approaches, which is again uh, held by the our DHIS2 land listing system. So, you know, the uh, not sell. Uh, this is how we use the uh, DHIS2 system to I I improve the treatment coverage and the viral um, load coefficient suppression. Thank you. Thank you so much for actually you still have three minutes it's fantastic to see people that keep time is beautiful thank you so much um if you have like questions uh, we will have so like a, a little bit of time at the very end so keep your questions on hold and we can uh, we can uh, ask later um next um i have uh, patrick patrick omeo from uh, his his Uganda. And uh, if I find the presentations, I will show you. Um, is it? Okay, I can It's uh, strengthening. Easy. Okay, so I've got to sacrifice my eyes. I hope. <laughs> so, uh, good good afternoon, uh, uh, colleagues. Yeah, so I'm here to. Oh, this is my old slide. <laughs> Is it pick from the drive? Because I made some change. Yeah. Please download from the drive. I made some minor changes. So uh, as this is changing, uh, OK. Yeah, so, um, so I meant to present uh, uh, an assessment that we are doing for the second time. So uh, last year at the same conference, we did present uh, a baseline assessment uh, that we we did regarding the same. So this time we are we are looking at midterm assessment. Uh, and so uh, so once again, Patrick Omiel is my name. I work with Hisp Uganda, but I've also been working with, with Vito here to support. Uh, uh, the development of metadata packages, but also supporting countries to, to to implement. And part of this work is really to see how we can take down these metadata packages and implement in country, and also learn from how it's working uh, in country. Yeah. So um, so again, this is really focusing on immunization uh, data, uh, and uh, this we were able to get this metadata package uh, and then take it down to Uganda and implement, but be a bit more systematic in how we are implementing this. And that's why we are doing this assessment. Yeah, so, uh, so and I'm here to again to present this on behalf of that team. We have we worked closely with the Ministry of Health, Uganda team. Uh, some of them were meant to be here and we present, but unfortunately, uh, they didn't get the opportunity to come over here. So, um, yeah, so, 
So a bit of context. So as I already mentioned, we I work with the HISP Uganda, but also in this work, we've been supporting metadata package development. And you know that uh, for the development of metadata package, it's been a lot of work with the HISP Center here, with the WHO, uh, to support this development of health toolkits. And uh, as you all know, most countries have already uh, uh, gone ahead to implement this toolkit. And it was really at the peak of COVID that many countries realize the value of having these toolkits. And quite a number of countries went ahead to adapt and implement for their national, uh, into their national systems. Uh, so for HISP Uganda, specifically for the immunization program, we started, we did the first uh, setup on the Ugandan instance uh, in 2018. And at the time we did for both the immunization program, uh, HIV, TB, malaria. So all for the other programs we were able to implement. Uh, but, uh, and the goal, of course, was really that uh, we had a lot of hopes that these toolkits, once we implement and this dashboard version, that it would help really to improve uh, analysis and data use, uh, and which was not the case. Um, we realized that uh, in country there was a lot of low use of this. People were not aware that we had even set it up because, again, we set it up without resources to be able to you know, train and get it out to work. So we took a step back uh, and then we said we need to have a more you know participatory approach to implementing this uh this so we uh so we decided okay now let's uh, revamp or let's improve on this dashboard uh, and really tailor it to uh, fit the needs of the people in country uh, to be able to use it so we adopted this participatory approach uh, that I will explain shortly so we did a baseline assessment uh, and in October, uh, when we had already made this revamp, but we hadn't deployed, so we did a baseline assessment. And then later, now, <laughs> after a year later, we are doing now a midterm assessment. And we are hoping to do an end line to, to close this. Uh, and so really, for this presentation, I'll be trying to know, to, to, to present results that try to compare both midterm and you know baseline uh, to see uh, if we've had any improvements. Yeah, so for that project work, again, it is part of the, the wider, uh, the broader GAVI-TCA support because we, as HISP, we support the Minister of Health through that arrangement. Uh, and so as we were doing these activities, we were really under that uh, support of GAVI-TCA. And as I already mentioned, to be able to do this work, for us to be able to improve on this dashboard, the first key activity that we had to do was really to have that stakeholder engagement. So we sat down with the team, you know, showed them what it was, and then asked for their input to make the improvements that we needed to make. Uh, and then the key thing was really first for them to understand indicator, but also see what additional indicators they needed to add uh, to make the dashboard more useful for them uh, to, to kind of align to their national needs. Uh, and then we went ahead and now started redesigning the dashboard. Because remember, when you do the uh, the toolkit, it comes with a lot of this. But we now had to start tailoring it. Uh, simple things like, you know, how the colors look like is very important for, for country. And some of those are th some of the things that we had to change. But also a lot of uh, visualizations uh, changed. Uh, because also DHIS to us quickly moved out. I mean, I mean it made improvements. Uh, on on the, on the program, uh, key example is like uh, this analysis around monitoring chart that wasn't there in the beginning, but now you have that. So we made all those uh, to be in the system. I mean, on the dashboard. And then, of course, in that process, we are doing a lot of demonstration, getting feedback from them. Uh, we did demonstration in the different meetings uh, for for uh, in country to get their feedback, and that helped us to know to refine uh, the dashboard. And then, of course, we had to get support from other partners because we didn't have resources to do the training. And we've been doing a lot of trainings ever since we did the baseline, uh, both at uh, dist mainly district level, but targeting both facility and district uh, users. Uh, and then, of course, we had to do this evaluation, both the baseline and the midterm. Yeah, so uh, that was a training that uh, I was doing at the district level. And this is how the dashboard now looks like. We, we didn't want to get to the details of how the dashboard is looking like. But basically, it's doing a lot of coverage, analysis, dropout, uh, the usual things around immunization. Yeah, so uh, so the objective of the midterm assessment was really to assess the user's perception. How do users perceive this dashboard, you know? 
uh, in the different areas where they think this dashboard should help them. So it was more like assessing their perception uh, towards the dashboard in helping them do analysis of specific uh, areas of need. And that's what we assessed at baseline, and that's what we're also looking at at midterm. And that's a measure of change that we want, we want to look at. And specifically, we are looking at whether this dashboard was appropriate and comprehensive enough to cover certain areas, uh, as I will show you shortly. But also, if the field was reliable uh, and accessible, but also if they, it meets their user experience. And also, of course, we are looking at the level of use. To what extent are they using this dashboard uh, in their routine uh, work? But also, what capacity needs did, did they uh, was needed for them to be able to use the dashboard? So, uh, so again, this methodology is not very scientific, but it's scientific. <laughs> so the sampling was uh, purposive, you know, uh, and a bit of convenience because we are really targeting health facility users and district uh, users. Uh, and in the process of selecting this, we're just really looking at people who are, you know, who use DHIS2 at these levels. So we didn't really go into random sampling or anything. We just wanted to target those users. Uh, and so we did the baseline and now we are doing the midterm. And uh, again, like I said, it's purposive and we did it conveniently. And we had this nice tool, uh, thanks to Vito. She shared with us a tool that we're able to use for this assessment. Uh, and it had both, you know, structured question, but also some open-ended question that, uh, and we simply used Google Forms to administer this, uh, targeting this group of uh, people. And so uh, again, so at baseline, we were able to get to about 90 respondents mainly at district and the health facility users. Those are the respondents that we, get, we, we targeted at baseline. Uh, but now when we did the midterm, again, like I was telling you, there is not like we are very tight on our sampling. We're just targeting that group of users. So we're able to reach out to uh, 216 uh, uh, respondents that we're able to get, but still targeting that group of users. Uh, but in there now, because we are now doing baseline and midterm we needed to know now people who participated in both and that would help us with some a kind of comparative you know uh, analysis so we had 62 people who we uh, i would say interviewed at baseline and those that we interviewed at what at uh, at midterm yeah and uh, in there we, and those are the people that as i go forward you'll notice that we are trying to make some comparisons see how their perceptions changed from the time we did mid mid, uh, mid uh, baseline assessment to midterm, yeah. So, uh, so this is just okay. So the key findings. So the profile of the people. So that's Uganda, and those are the different regions or provinces of Uganda. So of the 140 districts, we we, we reached out to 55 districts. And again, like I mentioned, this was conveniently sampling people, but trying to reach out to the right people. Uh, who use this uh, the system and uh, so we didn't get two regions to participate and because of how we're administering this we would wait during trainings ahead of trainings to administer uh, the tool so some of these regions were not represented in those so we couldn't reach uh, to all of them uh, but as you can see the people that we are targeting here uh, does it work oh Okay, so you see the majority of the people that we are really looking at uh, for this 200 and, uh, and, uh, 216, most of them are EPI, the immunization focal persons. These are the people who, who are program managers at the district for the immunization program, but also uh, some of them at facilities, they are the focal persons who, who run the programs. So they are the majority of the people that we were able to reach out. Uh, and then also the district biostatistician, these are people who who manage data at the district level. Yeah, they're the ones who basically coordinate reporting of data at district level. Uh, so they were the second, and then we also had uh, uh, this group of people who are the immunization focal person at the district level. These were facility, these were district level. And then we have uh, the health facility uh, uh, information assistants uh, being part of that. Yeah, so, so let's look at the first set of uh, areas that we're looking at. So. Uh, as already indicated, we are looking at the perceptions towards, you know, how they perceived the dashboard to help them do analysis. Uh, and we're looking at uh, those five areas, whether 
this dashboard is able to appropriately and comprehensively uh, help them, you know, measure coverage for immunization. Yeah, that was the first one down at the bottom. And then uh, dropout, whether they failed, this dashboard is able to help them measure dropout. And then stock, and stock here we're looking at both, you know, wastage uh, and generally understanding stock adequacy uh, at the uh, at the facility. And then cold chain, because we have also aspects of cold chain and then uh, adverse event following immunization. And so we the, 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 the tool that we're using is a, pi, a five point scale that we, so it, a user would respond, uh, the set of response would be whether you, you know, strongly disagree, uh, disagree, you are neutral, agree, and then strongly agree. So the people that would agree by our score would be those who are strongly and those who agree. If you are neutral, we don't count you. Yeah, so you could see that um, of the 216 people, uh, if you look at coverage, most of uh, oh. so if you look at coverage uh, as one of the areas, uh, close to I would say ninety percent would were okay that you know this dashboard is able to comprehensively and appropriately you know help them measure coverage. And indeed, in the dashboard, if you looked at it, we had a lot of uh, coverage analysis on the dashboard. Uh, and that is work for both the dropout and coverage, uh, close to uh, 90%. And then followed by the other areas. So anything that you see is dark and then light, the next, yeah. So you can see that the, the feelings at the dashboard is, uh, is able to uh, appropriately and comprehensively uh, measure these indicators. So overall, we thought that this is quite good, uh, but that is at midterm, you know. Uh, but then how does that compare with at baseline for the 62 people that participated in both? You know, we are trying to compare that. Yeah. So if when we did that comparison, you know, really filtering out the 62 and trying to compare with the baseline results, you could see that uh, the blue is the baseline and the red is, is midterm. And you can see that perceptions really went high up. Yeah, from uh, baseline for the different uh, parameters that uh, we are looking at. And that for us, we thought was, you know, um, uh, it was something that was notable. Know that uh, when you make improvements, you train people, build capacity, that, yeah, their perceptions definitely <laughs> uh, would change in, in the direction of, you know, seeing whether this is able to, to help them. Yeah. So, but here specifically, if you looked at, again, baseline, the areas of cold chain uh, were quite low. But uh, again, because of how we had, uh, people are not very, uh, these are not very commonly uh, used and uh, done analysis within the program, cold chain, adverse event following immunization. People are usually so bothered by, <laughs> by other areas. So that was in itself uh, an area for, but we made more effort and you could see that uh, there was substantial improvement. The other area that we looked at uh, was uh, accessibility. And here we also, you know, concerned around um, whether the dashboard provides them with user manuals, whether people are able to access the system. And again, for this, looking at both, base, both baseline and midterm, we also saw that uh, there was a great uh, improvement. And specifically here, we are trying to highlight that, you know, because we, we we made really good training materials and we think that in a way helped them to appreciate that there's some guidance towards them being able to use uh, the dashboard. Uh, yeah, then uh, training and capacity building. Um, again, for training, uh, if you look at the training, uh, training went down a bit and we realized that they were asking the questions at baseline and then later at midterm, uh, in the baseline, we are asking them whether they've been trained on DHIS2. Uh, the question was not properly uh, asked at that level. And then later, we are now asking a question, of, have you been trained on the dashboard? So that kind of uh, skewed our, I would say, results because it went down. But in terms of them ab appreciating the adequacy of the training, uh, that still, uh, uh, there was a change from uh, a baseline to uh, a midterm. There was still improvement. Uh, and then... We are also monitoring the views of the dashboard. And this is something that you can do within DHIS2. 
uh, that you can use the usage analytics of the DHIS to to see are people actually accessing the dashboard. Yeah, because that was another thing that we are interested in looking at. And we're looking at, so at baseline, as you can see, right here, uh, when we did the baseline, uh, about 78 per month would use, uh, well, I would say hits or views would be there in a month. But now that went to 200. Yeah, about threefold. Uh, the level, yes? Uh, we're just doing a count. But but again, yeah, in the whatever we could be very, you know, yeah, but we're looking at just a visit on that way on that dashboard. You can do counts, yeah. So we saw that yeah, there was traffic on the dashboard, yeah. But again, if we are looking at the users at facility level, are you looking at users at district level, the user base is broad, yeah. It should be much bigger than that. But still we think there's at least now um people accessing the dashboard, uh, which is good, but it's something we need to sustain. Yeah, so what are some of the challenges? Uh, of course, internet, whenever you do any digital tool, the first thing that comes out is internet. I've been told my time is up, but I beg for <laughs> one or two minutes I conclude. Okay, so internet has been a key thing, and even the last time that was something observed. Training, sometimes like you saw, we have now 200 uh, people that were able to reach out. And most of them will tell you, say, first time I'm seeing this. So training, we need to continue having training. Data quality, and specifically for immunization program for long, they, do, they have not properly set up this catchment area data. And so analyzing data at facility level becomes a problem for them. Uh, access to the system is one of those areas. There are some design improvements that uh, uh, we need to do. And then, of course, system performance. Uh, sometimes we've had some problems with our system performance. So for internet, um, one recommendation that we think is really we need to improve on internet, but specifically, you know, we had a zero rating of access to internet so that people can have uh, access to internet at these lower levels. But sometimes, you know, uh, there's more that needs to be done. Uh, catchment area, we are working to incorporate catchment area so that uh, they can uh, have uh, coverage data up to facility level and then improve use at that level. Training, we need to be more targeted. And then, of, of course, also enhancing system reliability uh, due to the challenges around infrastructure. Uh, we, going, we are going to continue improving on the dashboard, but also uh, based on the, uh, the things that are coming up around push analysis. We think this is something that we can configure on this dashboard so that it goes into some people's emails because these program officers don't have time to log into DHIS2. So the best we could do is you know, do push analysis to improve on this. We are going to continuously make improvements to this dashboard. We've had new changes around cumulative, you know, um, cumulative coverage or cumulative uh, dropout rate because for them they like cumulative uh, coverage instead of you know, doing month by month. Yeah, so we also want to do program impact assessment. <laughs> program impact assessment. And I liked what was done here, where we're able to now look at, have this really changed coverage? Has this changed uh, stock out or anything? So we are going to do that in our end line assessment. So in the next uh, DAC 2020, I need to come back for that. <laughs> Okay, and so we need to also scale up in other areas because if this works for immunization program, then we probably need think we can do this for uh, the other uh, areas, TB, HIV, malaria, where we also have the similar tools. Um, yeah, so thank you so much, and we just want to thank these people who we've worked with closely to, to do this. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, we now have, uh, due to a variety of hiccups, but it's, uh, it's the reality of, uh, of how it works here. Um, we have uh, Blaise online and he will present for us um, the, the assessment that they have done uh, about the implementation of the triangulation dashboards that they have. Um, so um, uh, Esther, will he pr share directly the screen? Okay. Now 
Should I stop sharing no. here? I don't know. Yes, yeah. Hi, Blaise. Hello. Okay. Uh, do it. I drag it here, I assume, no? Yes. Okay. 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 Blaise, can you try um, sharing your screen, please? One moment. <laughs> Yes. Super. And you can hear me loud and clear. Um, loud and clear is a big uh, is a big word, but try to be as close as possible to the microphone. Okay. How about Perfect. now? Perfect. Awesome. Thank you. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. I hope everyone is doing good. I apologize for my absence there, but I'll try to be as present as possible uh, as I present. Uh, my name is Blaise Mafende, and I'm a staff at uh, His Rwanda, DHS2 implementer. And for over about uh, almost the past two years, I've been uh, working with the uh, CDC and Affinit and the uh, University of Oslo to uh, implement uh, the data triangulation and surveillance and implementation uh, dashboards uh, to support uh, the Rwanda Biomedical Center, uh, specifically in line with the surveillance program and also the immunization program. So I'll be uh, giving you uh, a kind of scope or overview of uh, what the dashboard is about, uh, what we're currently monitoring or what we have been able to achieve in that period. Uh, and a few of the key steps, just to highlight, since we were focusing more on uh, uh, the technical challenges and the assessment of how the, uh, the dashboard has either impacted or improved the user's experience uh, in terms of data use. Uh, and then also, I'll go through a bit of the assessment evaluation. I will show you a bit of the methodology that we have uh, implemented, which has been something that is ongoing or continuous, if I may say, uh, and not uh, something that we have uh, we plan to do once and then carry out. And then we shall look at a bit of the findings and eventually the challenges and the uh, recommendations. So if you are looking at my screen, I hope it's uh, visible enough. Uh, this is basically the integration module or the full uh, integration of uh, our current dashboard. Uh, what you see on this left side is the electronic immunization registry. And what you see on the right side is the integrated disease surveillance uh, registry, which is also hosting the uh, vaccine preventable disease case-based surveillance uh, registry. And uh, the middle part is what we have referred to as the integration module, uh, which is the middleware that is connecting or pushing and pulling the different data uh, sources uh, to be able to generate what you see below here as the dashboard or the data triangulation dashboard. So currently, we have uh, four data sources or main data sources that we are targeting. Uh, and that has been the CIVO registry vital statistics. You have the vaccine logistics management information system and uh, the health management information system, which is the national uh, system, and then the NISR. These are the outside systems. And then obviously, as I've mentioned, the uh, immunization tracker, and then also the disease surveillance uh, tracker system. So when uh, it comes to the integration, uh, you have the integration module pooling CRVS information or bath registrations and pushing them to the immunization tracker. This is supporting the process for registering uh, new uh, children who have just come for new vaccines. And this is also ensuring that data quality is, is adhered to, whereby the demographics are not uh, typed, but they're easily pulled from CRVS. Uh, so additionally, to prevent or reduce the, the stress and the heartache of the vaccine officers having to log into the immunization system and then also the stock management system, we shall be pulling uh, the stock or antigens uh, data into the immunization tracker. And uh, once the data is stored in the immunization tracker, uh, we have analysis, analytics running at 11 p.m. This is only specifically for the data triangulation dashboard. When it comes to the CRVS, it is running at uh, approximately 30 to one hour. Every 30 minutes or one hour, uh, the new children are sent to the immunization registry. This is to ensure that uh, BCG doses are provided on time 
and also the information is already available by the time they are going to receive their vaccines. So this data is also pushed specifically uh, VPD-based antigens, uh, that is OPV and then mesos, and then also we want to, to look at the overall coverage, the drop rate, so we take BCG, DPT uh, to IDSR. So this is also going to be supporting the IDSR team uh, in uh, once they have the ca uh, meso cases, uh, AFP cases, or NETO in any case, which is not yet there in Rwanda. But if they are to have them, they will be able to compare it against uh, the immunization data. So this will be eradicating a kind of silo uh, data system that is uh, limiting uh, decision-making or even delaying decision-making. So uh, IDSR or disease, uh, the surveillance unit will be able to have access or they currently have access to the coverage information and also uh, stock-related data so they can be able to plan better when it comes to outbreaks or any epidemics kind of situation. The surveillance and also the electronic immunization registry. Uh, the reason for this is we have two different users. Uh, for the disease surveillance, we have the IDSR for Copperson, which is at the facility level, but you also, in addition, have the vaccinating office, uh, NAS. So these are two different users who do not have access to the other system. Hence why we had to almost duplicate 70-80% uh, of the dashboard uh, in both systems. So what you're going to see as the mentorship right now is uh, really a first quarter of it. Uh, and also what Bless. we have done after. Bless, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Are you still showing the 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 slide with the with the flow of data between the two with the two instances? Ah, there you go. Now it changed. Um, no, no, I was still reading the comments, then I moved to the next. Oh, okay, slide. sorry. Everyone was wondering. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. Okay, so then uh, we have also managed to import all the backlog data. So we have uh, the system updated and uh, currently running. So a few steps uh, to achieve the data translation project was the first one was conceptualization and development design. This was bringing all stakeholders together. Uh, to identify all the silo systems that are currently used by the different programs, the surveillance and the immunization, that's over here. And then we went to hard to identify all the key indicators that they actually want from uh, the other partner or the other program. This would help them in decision making based on what they usually request from the other programs. And then additionally, as you know, there is a, currently a DHS to data triangulation that has been developed in partnership with CDC and the University of Oslo, that was uh, downloaded and uploaded in our instances, and then we edited it based on what the country uh, wished for and updated or uh, designed it to the local context uh, for easy adaptation and implementation. Now, once we finished the integration module, which is connecting those all different indicators, uh, we went on to the training and the capacity uh, building, which took about two, three months. And uh, why it took a while was to ensure that one, we supported the capacity at the national level, which would be uh, handling the full support from to the lower levels and they only get to talk to us. Yes, so after implementation, we did have to carry, a, if I can say an assessment to see if this dashboard is really uh, responding to its uh, ultimate purpose whereby we had uh, we carried out uh, an assessment or an evaluation to see uh, to, first of all to see how it's being supporting the two programs but also uh, assessing uh, if let's say the, the dashboard uh, the technology itself so we started by so we started by uh, having a, a technical working group uh, to uh, with all stakeholders uh, to from health facility, district, provincial, and health officials to uh, to guide and oversee the implementation of the transaction dashboard because these people have been have played the law implementing. So we just want to see uh, if they are more happy with what we have done. So there is also a monthly dashboard review and analysis. This uh, uh, throughout the uh, uh, of, uh, based on the electronic musician registry and disease surveillance uh, system dashboard, uh, were reviewed and analyzed on a monthly basis, uh, uh, looking at uh, how dashboard has been uh, accessed, what are the users, and so forth. Of course, we also looked at uh, the uh, hierarchical user support line, 
the, high, uh, the higher echo user support line was strengthened to facilitate efficient communication and problem resolution, extending from health facility, district, province, and uh, national, and uh, of course, uh, in collaboration with the HISP Rwanda that has been driving this uh, uh, process. So later on, uh, Equatory uh, Field Assessment and Mentorship has been organized in collaboration with the AFNET team and the RBC team to uh, have the facility level visits to uh, be, because like, uh, to be able to get closer to the user and also uh, get the feedback on the uh, dashboards, the implementation issues, and provide on-site uh, support. So uh, a checklist or a list of questions has been sent out, trying to assess, to assess and evaluate the, the usefulness of this uh, triangulation dashboard, uh, whereby, as you can see, uh, 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 with regards to the access, uh, uh, the initial access to DHS transition dashboard was uh, they, they did have an issue of uh, the 18 percent. Uh, uh, the 18 uh, the initially the access was at 18 percent, but and people with difficulties accessing dashboard was at 82 percent. But the current access now to DHS transition dashboard, uh, so there has been a very a uh, big improvement uh, uh, whereby uh, after this uh, regular mentorship and uh, calls follow up and so forth uh, improvement of course it was a joint exercise with the the affinate team and the rbc team uh, when you look at the uh, the use uh, uh, the use uh, the, the, the use uh, 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 Thirty-six percent started using the the dashboard, but gradually the the percentage kept on improving. But uh, since it was it's still at the early stage of this dashboard implementation, so there's still a lot of efforts to be made to to have uh, this dashboard uh, uh, respond to its ultimate purpose. When you look at uh, uh, this uh, this chart. Uh, with regards to the frequency of use of this uh, uh, of this dashboard, uh, you look at uh, uh, there is a uh, uh, fifty five percent of uh, people who say they they don't use, so they don't use. Uh, 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 but when you look at those who are using it to be weekly, three months, so weekly, so you find. Uh, uh, we are not yet there, so there is uh, still uh, a big uh, challenge to push people to consult this dashboard because if the, the dashboard is there to help uh, from the top of the country, from the program people, to be able to compare to status, disease outbreaks and vaccination coverage by location, by, by location and by period, so there is a a long uh, way to go. Here, in summary, uh, this is uh, uh, what I would want to share. Uh, uh, when it comes to uh, programs uh, performance in a dashboard, because as I said, the there are two dashboards. One to help program to, to monitor program to be able to monitor the performance, but also there also another dashboard that helps to be able to identify the immunity gaps by location and by uh, by period. So some of the findings, uh, we, as you have seen in even the previous presentation, there's still data discrepancy, especially uh, talking about tracker systems. Sometimes people don't update in time uh, the, the events, and that to some extent contribute to data discrepancy, especially uh, uh, when it comes to disease uh, surveillance, where sometimes uh, when uh, sometimes people just notify cases, but the follow-up steps, even though are being made, that th they are not uh, 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 updating the system uh, in, in time. So there is a mismatch between disease surveillance uh, and case based data. So there is a consistency when you start up, uh, uh, considering to weekly 
Uh, here, I want to precise that in Rwanda, uh, they are still running weekly uh, uh, disease surveillance reporting, but also on case-based reporting. There's also a drop uh, a drop outlet, so there is a very high uh, variability across districts, incorrect dominators calculations. These also are somehow attributed to uh, uh, data sources and also discussions and dominators, which is a, uh, always uh, a, a point of concern across uh, all our countries. So when it comes to dashboards, uh, data accuracy, of course, there is a uh, we have rather it's outdated or missing data in indicators, or indicators are not reflecting reality. So this is always uh, 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 attributed to the data completeness in the in the in the, tra the two tracker systems. Uh, there is also a, a, a training and a mentorship uh, uh, needs that has been. Uh, 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 that that, that, that uh, is also a point of concern, uh, whereby, uh, as you have seen in the previous presentation, uh, as we talk, only uh, 13 over 30 districts has been uh, trained, uh, so there have uh, been uh, a, a budget gap uh, that uh, we couldn't train the whole country. So there is a need to train more people and train the whole country to be able to have uh, 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 this dashboard uh, does uh, its job. When it comes to immunity gap, this is mainly looking at uh, the immunization registry uh, uh, dashboard because in Rwanda, the, the immunization registry is now, uh, the whole immunization program is fully digital, so which means uh, there the completeness is uh, almost uh, 95%, but since we are we are fetching data from the disease surveillance and also be able to generate dashboards to divide the immunity gap. So there is a still uh, a low reporting, as I mentioned above, for suspected cases for the program to be able to uh, to 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 be able to detect the immunity gap. Of course, there is that also uh, 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 contributed this uh, discrepancies in the immunization coverage, where you find there is a consistency. Uh, looking at data we have uh, in the immunization registry, which is uh, which which has a, a higher completeness rate, and the disease outbreaks uh, event program that has uh, uh, a low uh, 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 completeness. So, with regards to challenges, uh, so there is data heterogeneity. So, which means. There, there are data that we may need that may be from across and that we don't have uh, in the other systems. So there is a need to uh, or improve or to work on more metadata across the two systems to be able to have uh, 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 homogeneous data across the two systems. There's also data quality issues. There's also, uh, uh, if I can say, the interoperability issues, mainly as a uh, even though we do have a uh, system, as Braz is explaining, uh, pushing data across two sides, uh, sometimes the technology may not be at your side, and you find uh, the the error rates uh, may contribute to or to the data quality issues and also affect uh, 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 affect the, uh, the the dashboard displays. Of course, there is a data volume and also staff turnover. Uh, whereby as you, you train people, uh, this is uh, across all countries, you train people, but at the end of the day, people are free to move, uh, uh, to move, if I like people that you ha have participated in training, uh, this, uh, this round of training, maybe they are not there uh, to keep on supporting the, uh, the health facilities, program people, uh, AP supervisors at the district and the uh, provincial levels. As of next step, uh, of course, we, we are looking into uh, uh, continuously supporting uh, uh, this dashboard to especially focusing on user support to ensure that they explore this dashboard but on maximum, uh, trying to be their capacity to be able to know how they can better use the dashboards, interpreting the situations and uh, uh, 
uh, whether performance issues, immunity gap issues, and so forth, having the webinars, uh, especially to present the, the progress, status, getting feedback from different stakeholders and partners, but also uh, doing some interoperability works with the RAP systems to ensure that when it comes to or like the RAB results for disease surveillance, we can easily get the results automatically from the, the RAB information systems uh, ad trying to address the data quality concerns in the disease surveillance system that uh, because by having the RAB information, the RAB results data in the disease surveillance, that we are, we are able to, to confirm cases and also be able to be able to uh, to confirm the whether it's an outbreak, with a case, and also be able to to, to identify the immunity gap in a given area of uh, of the country. So I think uh, that's it for uh, for for me and uh, for Braz. Uh, and I think Braz, I have uh, presented to you well. So if you uh, still online, so that's that's all for this use case. Thank you very much for your time and your attention. So I would end by giving thanks to our co-partners, UIO, especially Victoria and CDC team, AFNET team, and UIO team. Thank you very much. Thank you so much to our presenters. I had a, a quick question. Um, how easy or hard will be to adapt um, what you have done along on uh, immunization to another program? Thank you. Considering it's immunization, I'm assuming it's for him, or is it like a general thing? Okay. Yeah, I, I think it should be. It shouldn't be hard. The only thing is, uh, as we are doing the assessment, we need to uh, maybe just trick the questions to point to uh, things that are program specific. So the the quick thing, of course, would be okay. Let's start with a. Because the intervention you are doing here is really trying to tailor uh, the the metadata package that we implement in country to fit program it. So you have to go through the processes of you know consulting the country, uh, tailoring the uh, the dashboard to fit their needs, and then of course modifying the question the questionnaire uh, to fit that assessment, and then you're able to do. So I think it is not wouldn't be so hard for someone who has done like we have done to do in another program should be pretty uh, easy. I can compliment because I was collaborating with them. Um, I have other countries that have started using that same tool um, for other different type of interventions. They were very much uh, around uh, in the EPI dashboards. I have other countries that have done pre-post to complete, like from zero DHIS to uh, the deployment of DHIS as an HMIS system. Um, I have like other countries that have done it for their VPD or their um, VPD in a sense like case-based surveillance of uh, vaccine preventable diseases um, and other that have done it for um, the implementation of the electronic register for immunization. So we're trying to expand it as much as possible to different use cases. It has started with the idea um, because of where we were also Gavi funded, so more around immunization, but I have other countries that I've started doing it in different in different realms. So the idea is that it's a flexible tool that can be adapted to different contexts and to different needs, uh, depending on on the type of interventions as well. It could be like a pre-post. It could be simply to assess what is like the status as of now and to see how we can progress to assess better what are the user perspective and the use of data. It's very much depending on uh, on the needs. It, it's it's flexible enough to expand it to different uh, topics and different type of uses. I would say. Yes, thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Uh, firstly, thank you very much, all presenters, for your interesting and informative presentations. Uh, I have two questions. My name is Gulshad. I'm uh, from the UNDP Global Fund Partnership. Um, I have two questions to the presenters and one question for the team of the University of Oslo. And the first question is to Pradeep. You mentioned, Pradeep, that you did the comparative analysis of outcomes before and after introducing the line lists, yeah? But the previous system, paper-based system, it had a lot of data quality issues. So I just wonder how you factored in the data quality issues in your comparative analysis, 
Yeah, that is for you, the question. I have one question to Patrick. Patrick, in your midterm evaluation, uh, initially it sounded very much like you were focusing on user perceptions, but then you also mentioned that you looked at the data on the immunization coverage, how it changed, yeah? Uh, if, if I understood you correctly. So you looked at the coverage data and dropout data as well. So just to confirm my understanding, you looked at user perception in terms of how easy it is to use the system, how, what they saw on their end. But did you also complement it with more like data from the DHS too on how the immunization coverage changed? Uh, yeah. Do you see what I mean, the question? Yeah. So that's for you. And the question to your team, Victoria, is... Um, does the standard uh, configuration of DHS2 allow to see the user demographics in more um, detail? What I mean by that is, can we see how many unique users are using dashboards? Uh, what geographies they are in? For example, we may have some provinces or districts where they use them, in others they do not. Maybe it has to do with leadership or other issues. So that is a question for you. Sorry, maybe too many questions. No, these are very relevant questions. So very quickly, because we have only five minutes. So you, you, and then. Thank you very much for this very nice good question. And, and thank you for your observation too. So we, uh, as I said in the presentation, uh, we started the DHS2 from 2019 by incorporating all the the paper systems the data in the system there was no uh the tracking so yes at that time so uh but later when we have all the information in the system from 2022 we started the individual tracking and there we compare before 2022 and after 2022 thank you thank you That's no we, we didn't look at uh coverage data in terms of what the coverage was there and after. No, we are just looking at whether users feel the dashboard is able to help them measure coverage appropriately and comprehensively. That, that, that's really what we're looking at. But in our end line, sponsored by Victoria, <laughs> we should go into that direction where we are now trying to look at what was the coverage, but also trying to do some attribution. Yeah, to see if we this has had some impact on the program itself. Uh, right now, we are more of if they use because the first thing we really want to make sure that users are able to take this up, but they should also feel that it's helping them, you know. And then the next will now be has it impacted on the program, and that's what we should be doing at I would say end line our assessment. Yeah. I think in general, it's a work in progress that we're doing. Uganda was really the first country that started using it. So we're also a bit exploring along the line as we are deploying with him and other countries. And indeed, these are fundamental things to start triangulating with the use. But we really try to start with really use the perspective and perception of like how much all the work that was done was adding up to the the, the good use and uh, and the use of data and the use of the platform and the perception of of all of that of the end user in the end because data quality is very easy to analyze and and assess but like uh, if you don't understand what are the like the root causes behind the use of the data itself it's also very complex to really understand and pinpoint why that data quality is really not reaching that level that you would like to achieve at the end of the day so that's where we started and that's as we settle in the in the construct and the, and the use of uh, of the different uh, of the dashboard, uh, that's where we want to really start assessing, triangulating with really the, the the program data together with the data that we are getting from that assessment. So that's where we are going. On the on the side of the users, yes, there are also scripts that um, Patrick is using, and also I know that Blaze was uh, was starting to use as well. Where like uh, the type of users that are interacting with the with the um, with the dashboards and in general like the items on the dashboard itself, I know that Blaz uh, was also trying to write up a script. I don't know if he already did. Uh, Blaz, uh, like, uh, give me a voice from the sky if I'm saying something stupid. But I knew that like he wanted to create a script where he could actually check which items in the dashboard were more interacted with, 
um, of course, there are also best practices that have to be put in place. So yes, what he was showing were like uh, individual users, not individual person. So best practice would want that one user is one person. At the end of the day, I also don't have control of all the implementations on the planet. So we do have the tools to do that, but that requires best practices to be kept in place and to be monitored accordingly. Just very, very last yeah. comment. So, so you can know which user. So the idea is you need to do some extra data uh, extraction. There, there's no UI that helps within the DHS to backend. You know, this user is from this you know district or whatever, and you're able to, you can't do that. But it's one of those things that we could do an app, an app that can maybe help uh, extract that. But yeah, the, the good thing, the information is there, but it's just not easy to quickly get, you know? Yeah. Thank you so much, everyone.